welcome to this lecture number 7 on uh, continuation of this aquifer classification. So, we had uh, in the previous lecture, we were discussing about uh, the aquifer characteristics and classification and uh, specifically we discussed about say two types of aquifer. The first one is the unconfined or stable aquifer and we also discussed about confined aquifer which is also known as artesian aquifer or pressure aquifer. This unconfined aquifer is uh, having an impervious stratum only at the bottom and uh, it has a variable top, uh, it does not have any confining layer and water table which is variable uh, depending upon various factors. So, that forms the upper uh, uh, flexible boundary of this unconfined aquifer. On the other hand, so this confined aquifer, it is uh, known as the artesian aquifer or pressure aquifer, it has two confining layers, one at the top as well as the one at the bottom as shown here. And uh, so here this water, the ground water will be under pressure much above the atmospheric pressure, that is why it is also known as pressure aquifer or uh, artesian aquifer. Now, let us also learn about say two more aquifers. So, the first one is the perched aquifer So, this perched means a raised aquifer. Essentially, it is a locally raised aquifer. Suppose in a particular uh, area below the ground, there is a small saucer like uh, impervious layer for a limited extent and uh, over this this impervious layer, some amount of uh, ground water gets stored. So, this represents the water table and uh, so here this represents a zone of aeration and below that, so this represents a zone of saturation. So, this one represents the perched aquifer. So, the perched uh, actually, so I would like to say this is the perched water table and uh, this one is the perched aquifer. So, here we should uh, bear in mind that the impervious layer, let me write it as a localized impervious layer, has a very limited aerial extent and therefore, the amount of ground water stored in a, in a perched aquifer is also limited and uh, so therefore, it is available only for a small period of time. And of course, uh, because so above this perched water table there is zone of aeration and below the perched water table there is zone of saturation. So, it also is uh, included as one of the maybe here you can call it a localized aquifer, localized uncon con unconventional aquifer. So, that is what a perched aquifer represents. So, this forms the third type of aquifer and the last 
The fourth and the last type of aquifer that we are going to discuss here is the leaky aquifer. which can also be called semi confined aquifer. In this case, it has it is a confined aquifer. The only difference is one of the layers either the the bottom layer And in this case, the top layer so this is a impermeable top layer. So, this is a semi permeable bottom layer. or it can be the other way also and of course, so this is the the other name for the semi permeable bottom layer is equiclude I am sorry equitard. And uh, this is the leaky aquifer. It can also be the other way also that is uh, the top layer may be semi confined semi permeable or uh, uh, equitard and the bottom layer. So, in this case uh, So, this is the top equitard that is semi permeable layer. And this is the bottom semi permeable or semi pervious impervious layer. And here this is the the leaky aquifer also known as semi confined aquifer. So, in this case, so since the top layer is uh, semi pervious permeable or uh, say pervious. So, from the top layer there will be a slow contribution of ground water into this leaky aquifer. Slow ground water contribution. 
from top. Likewise, as mentioning here, the semi permeable or say semi pervious bottom layer in this case there will be so this represents slow groundwater leakage at the bottom. So, it is for this reason, so these uh, are known as semi confined aquifers. So, basically here you can say it is uh, on one end either at the top or at the bottom there is a confined there is a confining layer which is fully impervious and uh, on the other end the either at, in this case here it is at the bottom and in this case here it is at the top so the layer is uh, an equitard which is semi semi pervious okay so these the unconfined aquifer or the water table aquifer the confined aquifer or the uh, artesian or pressure aquifer and thirdly the perched aquifer or uh, raised aquifer we may also refer to as a localized raised unconfined aquifer and fourthly it is a leaky aquifer or uh, say semi confined aquifer. So, these are the four types of uh, aquifers and uh, each one of them will bear will yield ground water depending upon uh, the uh, various uh, factors and uh, and among this one of the important factors which determines the uh, this uh, the groundwater yield from an aquifer is known as the storage coefficient also known as storativity and this storativity is the the volume of water you can say volume of ground water that an aquifer releases or absorbs per unit surface area per unit change in in uh, head obviously head is uh, measured perpendicular to the the surface area so, this is the known as a storage coefficient or storativity and uh, generally, so the for confined aquifer, and uh, this is denoted by the letter S, generally for confined aquifers it is a uh, unitless basically because it represents ratio of two volumes for confined aquifers so this is uh, 
the storativity will be in the range of five to the power five into ten to the power minus five to five into ten to the power minus three. So this is the the storage coefficient and uh, it the specific yield or the total ground water yield from an aquifer very much depends upon this uh, parameter. And uh, so, this uh, uh, storage coefficient is considered as one of the three important formation constants of an aquifer, the other two being uh, the hydraulic conductivity or permeability and uh, transmissivity or transmissibility, which of course, we will discuss uh, sometime later in this lecture. So, now we will uh, discuss little bit about the, the ground water basins and uh, springs. So, just like the water basin which is the, which essentially represents a particular uh, area on the surface of earth which holds water and there will be a, say there will be a specific uh, drainage pattern. So, in this case a ground water basin is also some kind of a physical entity which has a certain aerial extent. And uh, this, uh, this ground water basin consists of one large aquifer as well as a number of uh, small aquifers. Just like in the surface water basin, there will be a main course, main uh, stream channel or main course and uh, it is uh, there will be a number of uh, uh, other courses. So, in this case also in case of ground water, so there will be a main aquifer and uh, a, a number of interrelated uh, aquifers. So, here we can this ground water basin. So, we may define it as a hydro hydrologic or hydrogeologic unit. containing a large aquifer and a number of other interconnected aquifers. connected or say connected aquifers. And uh, like the surface uh, water basin or catchment which is also referred to as watershed. So, this ground water basin also has uh, storage and this uh, transport ground water transport both are uh, involved and uh, many times. So, this uh, ground water basins uh, consist of a large area, aerial extent as well as uh, depth which can uh, yield a significant amount of ground water. Now, let us come to the springs. So, the spring is it is basically a water gushing out from the ground surface is uh, generally known as a spring. So, we can write this as our uh, concentrated discharge 
of ground water appearing at uh, ground surface as a current of flowing water. So, here you can say spring it is uh, basically at the ground surface, it represents an interface and uh, upstream of the spring the water is in ground water form and downstream of the spring the water is in water uh, comes on earth and so it is a surface water uh, form. And uh, these springs may be of different uh, types such as uh, so here you can say this is types of springs and of course, so this uh, the springs in this the water may come come out as a current either in the normal temperature or it may come out as a current of uh, a hot or a higher temperature. So, like this so, the spring can be a, a either a normal water spring or a hot water spring. So, in this uh, in the normal water spring the temperature is the normal temperature and which are generally referred to as uh, simply springs. So, these are let me write here. So, this is the normal temperature springs. So, the various types let us uh, discuss few of them among the normal temperature springs is the depression springs. followed by contact springs followed by artesian springs or say fracture artesian springs then there is a tubular spring. So, these are the four important types of uh, springs. Now, let us discuss briefly about uh, each one of them. So, here let us consider say suppose Suppose this is a, a ground water, uh, this is a subsurface layer and uh, in this say let us say so this is the ground level. and then this is the water table. So, here at this point 
the water table meets the ground level and so therefore here this we have what is known as a depression spring through which the water gushes out from us and suppose there is some uh, as normal even if we create a very small depression, so the water gushes out through that. So, this is the first type of spring. Next we have what is known as the, the contact spring and in this contact spring, suppose we have a a ground water a mound and uh, with so this is an impervious layer and here It is overlaid by a pervious layer and in this, so this is a and this represents the water table and this water table is in contact with the ground profile at uh, at these two points where we have we will get a contact spring. So, this is again a so essentially here what happens is so the water slowly re gets released from this contact spring and then it flows along the, the impervious layer of this uh, soil or uh, rock mound and so eventually, so it may join a stream or it may join a, a lake or uh, any other uh, surface storage area like that. So, essentially this contact spring is uh, found and of course, in this case unlike the, uh, the depression spring, so generally the water uh, the, uh, the current velocity will be slightly less. Now, the third one let us uh, is the fracture artesian spring wherein we have suppose a pervious layer which is overlaid by an impervious layer. So, this is uh, impervious layer, again this is also an impervious layer in between there is a pervious layer which is an aquifer. 
So, this is a and there is a fracture. So, here this you can uh, say this is a fractured rock. over the impervious layer which is lying above the pervious layer and through this fracture the water gushes out through what is known as fracture artesian spring. So, essentially, so this is per this uh, there is a fracture in the impervious layer which is over and above the aquifer and through this fracture. So, the water gushes out through what is known as the fracture artesian spring. And the last one, so these are the three types of springs. The last one let us discuss is the, the tubular spring. And in this tubular spring, we have suppose this is the a fractured rock so these are the fractures in the rock And uh, suppose this is the level up to which the ground water is stored. And obviously, the same level is maintained here also, and uh, here at this point. So, this is a tubular spring. And uh, here you can say, so these are the fractures saturated with ground water. And of course, uh, so this is the ground level. So, because here the fracture continues up to the ground and then the ground water stored in these fractures, the level of ground water stored in these fractures is above this uh, the level of tubular spring. So, the water gushes out as a spring. So, these are the four types of uh, springs. And uh, now, let us also discuss about the high temperature springs which are known as uh, say thermal springs. They are also known as uh, geothermal springs. So, in this what happens is, so the because of the, the large temperature, the hot temperature through this uh,
cooling magma chamber. So, this is the heat getting released and uh, what this does is Suppose this is the so here the surface water gets released so this is the descending cool surface water And uh, here, of course, uh, we have a so this descending cool surface water comes in contact with the heat released through the cooling magma, and then here, so this is the So, this is the level of water and uh, this is the, the rising hot water. So, when this uh, descending cool water, cold water, cold surface water comes in contact with the heat released by the cooling magma chamber. So, its its temperature gets increased and then it comes as a rising hot water so here so this is the hot spring or uh, geyser and obviously so this uh, the there will be many so this cooling magma chamber is at a, a great depth something like say 3000 meters or so and because of that, so the thermal springs and many times so they will also have say other uh, mineral ingredients and uh, so these cooling springs are uh, available in or uh, can be these uh, hot water springs or uh, say thermal springs or geothermal springs can be found in different parts of uh, the world such as uh, say New Zealand there are ample amount of sun and many times. So, this uh, geothermal springs are also used in this uh, generating electricity. So, these are some of the, the springs. So, initially we saw the, the four uh, normal temperature springs or simply the springs and followed by we also discuss briefly about the, the geothermal or uh, say thermal spring or uh, hot water spring. Now, so th this is uh, so far we have discussed about the ground water storage or occurrence part of it. Now, let us discuss little bit about the Darcy's law, which essentially represents the basic equation or basic law governing the ground water movement. So, here, so this Darcy's law, we can state this as the discharge Q is equal to, so firstly it was stated as the discharge is proportional to I into A. So, this Q is the discharge, 
So, here this is the ground water discharge and this I is known as the hydraulic gradient hydraulic gradient and this A is known as the is the cross sectional area of flow of ground water flow. So, when Q is proportional to I into A the product of I and A. So, we can as well write this Q is equal to K I A where K is the proportionality constant which is known as permeability, it is also known as the coefficient of permeability or it is also popularly known as hydraulic conductivity. So, here we can write this down as a Q over A which is equal to K into I. So, this Q over A, Q over A is also equal to the velocity and in this case it is the here we can take it as the apparent ground water seepage velocity and here the left hand side has a dimensions of velocity. So, for this equation to be dimensionally homogeneous, so the dimensions of this k which is the coefficient of permeability or it is also simply known as permeability or hydraulic conductivity is equal to the dimensions of velocity divided by the dimensions of this uh, hydraulic gradient. And this hydraulic gradient is a pure number with no units. So, therefore, this hydraulic conductivity or uh, permeability or coefficient of permeability has the units of velocity, has the dimensions as well as units of velocity. So, this is uh, Darcy's law which was uh, uh, stated by the French hydraulic engineer Henry Darcy in uh, say 19 in I am sorry 1856. So, here this I which is the the hydraulic gradient. So, this is equal to minus d h by d l. So, there is a negative sign to indicate that as the travel distance the ground water travel distance l increases the head the ground water head or h decreases. So, therefore, so this i will have a negative sign. So, therefore, here we can mention we can state here. So, this is V is equal to minus K into d h by d l. So, this is which is equal to simply K into i. So, this relationship is popularly known as Darcy's law, which is applicable for say ground water flow. And uh, as you can see, so this ground water flow, it is a laminar flow, it is a highly laminar flow with the velocity is uh, very small. So, therefore, so the this ground water velocity 
for which the Darcy's law is applicable. So, it depends upon the parameter which governs the laminar flow that is the Reynolds number. Here we can denote this as R e. So, this uh, for the so the Darcy's law is valid for Reynolds number is let me say perfectly valid for Reynolds number less than 1. And uh, here we know this Reynolds number, it is defined as the ratio of inertia force to viscous force and uh, mathematically it is equal to rho V d by mu, where rho is the density, V is the velocity, d is the characteristic dimension and mu is the, the viscosity or the coefficient of viscosity. And so for uh, Reynolds number, greater than 1 and less than 10. So, the Darcy's law is more or less applicable more or less that means, it is almost valid. So, only when the Reynolds number exceeds this 10, which is very rare in case of uh, ground water flow. So, then so this uh, the Darcy's law will not be valid. And also we know that as per the Hagen Poisel equation for the hydraulic conductivity. So, this uh, coefficient of permeability can be expressed by C d m square into gamma by mu. So, this is by analogy with uh, Hagen Poisel flow. Equation for laminar flow. So, this uh, coefficient of permeability. So, here this C is the shape factor and this d m is the, the mean particle size and this gamma is the specific weight of water fluid and of course, in this in case of ground water it is a water. Okay. And obviously, so this uh, mu is the viscosity and uh, so this is equal to rho into g, where rho is the density of water. Okay. Now, so here we can uh, conclude that, so this k 
is equal to C d m square and this uh, gamma which is rho into g and uh, this g if we express it as the denominator of the denominator. So, this will be now this is uh, g and I am sorry this uh, gamma if I express it as denominator of denominator. So, then so this is the kinematic viscosity which is denoted by the small letter nu. Therefore, the, co the hydraulic conductivity or the coefficient of permeability or permeability is inversely proportional to the kinematic viscosity of water. So, as the kinematic viscosity changes, so the hydraulic conductivity varies uh, inversely. So, here this term is C d m square, it is denoted by k 0 which is uh, the which is known as the intrinsic permeability. So, obviously, so this uh, C d m square it has nothing to do with the fluid properties it has only to do with the properties of the flow medium which is uh, soil or rock in this case. So, here so this uh, intrinsic of course, so this intrinsic permeability this is also known as a specific permeability. Is uh, related with the permeability by the equation k is equal to k 0 into g divided by nu. So, this uh, and the, the dimensions of this intrinsic permeability has the dimensions of uh, this uh, dimensionless constant as well as d m square. So, it has the dimensions of say length square. So, this is the, uh, the intrinsic permeability which has uh, so this is a a function of the flow medium only okay and uh, in the next class we'll discuss about this uh, transmissibility or transmissivity as well as uh, other. Uh, so, this transmissivity along with this hydraulic conductivity and uh, storativity forms what are known as the formation constants of aquifers. So, in the next lecture we will discuss further about this uh, hydraulic conductivity, transmissivity and uh, its determination and uh, other related topics. Thank you.